Howdy y'all, this is Magus Gaius Mycelius here to talk about making grain spawn with wheat berries, red wheat berries, or wheat grains, wheat kernels. They're called berries, I don't know if they're technically berries or not. Uh, I have this Paul Laos brand, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I'm gonna use this five pound bag. I'm gonna eyeball about half of it, approximately 2.5 pounds here. That gives me enough for six jars. You can see I spilled quite a bit. Uh, try not to do that. Uh, I just had to cut the bag open. If you know how to get those twist ties open at the top, if you, if you can pull on those threads correctly, uh, they just come apart and open up for you. And you have less likelihood of getting bits of bag in the results. This particular brand, hi Sylvester. Sylvester is a kitty boy. This particular brand, tends to have a lot of peas in it. I don't know why. Um, I'm assuming it's likely that it's processed on machinery that also processes peas, but it's fine. The mushrooms will grow on these peas regardless. So you don't need to pick them out or worry about them. You just hydrate them along with the rest of the grain. Now we're using red wheat berries here because they're affordable in my area. We could be using something like um, rye berries are very popular. Uh, they require a little bit different treatment than I'm than I have here, but um, uh, I like these because they're very forgiving. I'm going to add some garden gypsum. This will add calcium. I just do a couple handfuls. I don't really care very much about measuring it. You don't need a lot. The amount that I put here is probably more than I need, um, but you know. I just do a couple little pinches and you can see all the dust kicking up from uh, the grain. The grain is very dusty and it fills the room when you're working with it. So. We're gonna fill this with water. We wanna cover the grain fully and we wanna cover it enough that it has room to expand uh, this should be more than enough. Uh, if you don't put enough water in there, sometimes you'll come back and you'll see it's not fully hydrated because a fair amount of the grain is exposed above the surface of the water because the grain underneath puffed up. So you want to make sure you have like a half inch to an inch um, above the grain level to, to really make sure you're hydrating these. Now, put a lid on it. Put the time on it. We want to soak this for between 12 and 24 hours. We really don't want to go much beyond 24 hours because they will start to sprout. And once they start to sprout, they're a little too easy to overcook. They're a little more difficult to uh, work with. They get mushy more easily. There's Lollipop. She's a Lollipop cat. Now, um, we're gonna let this soak overnight and what's happening here is that these grains are alive. So they're gonna start to wake up. They're gonna start to draw moisture into them through pores in their endocarp, specific pores that draw it in. And they're going to begin converting the kind of long-term storable rough carbohydrates into maltose sugars, which are much easier to digest for both the a baby plant and also for our mushrooms, which is critical. Uh, now it's about, I wanna say 18 hours later or so, we're gonna begin the boil. So we're gonna put it on high. We wanna get it to a low simmer. We wanna get it started at a low simmer. We don't wanna start at a rolling boil. You can see I'm stirring very thoroughly. You wanna make sure that you don't let the grains settle in such that too many of them are resting against the bottom of the pot for too long because you'll burn the grains and that could cause problems. It's also very stinky if you do it. Um, it can ruin a whole batch of grains. So 
I'm gonna be careful. You wanna make sure you stir it often. You can see I'm cutting time between waiting. The the, the uh, heat is still on high, but I'm, I'm coming back and I'm stirring often. And I'm getting thoroughly, I'm really scraping the bottom. Now this is a non-stick pot. You don't have to use non-stick. The liquid that we're making here we can use but we're not going to keep it this time you can keep it and use it and set it aside and uh, i've even made very successful liquid cultures you can see the water here is beginning to boil this is a, a proper simmer and that's about where you want to get it. Now, once it's simmering, you want to um, set a timer for 15 minutes. You can do 20. 20 minutes is common. I wouldn't push it past 20. I usually walk away from it at some point and forget about it. So I like to set it for 15 because uh, that helps me get to it sooner rather than later. Um, I'm going to turn the heat down a little bit. Uh, I turn it down quite a bit here. I actually turn it back up to about 6 in a moment here uh, but I, I kind of round it off down to like a low medium low um, there's my timer 15 minutes and then just keep uh, keep stirring it you can put the pot on, the lid on it now I'm gonna wait a little bit uh, when I want to kind of ramp the boil up a little bit hotter near the end Now, an interesting thing that happens is this is very similar to beer making. When we soaked these grains overnight, what we did was we woke up the grains, we allowed them to begin converting their um, long-term, storable, stable carbohydrates into the more easily digestible maltose sugar, something that these grains just know how to do. Um, that kind of prepares the embryo inside of the seed to wake up and begin digesting and <clears throat> that's actually the first step in the beer making process it's called malting and they'll take grains like rye uh, barley mostly for beer you can use wheat for beer as well uh, give it about 18 to 24 hours to soak depending on the grain and then they will put it in a kiln and in that kiln they'll heat it they'll smoke it and um, that kills the grains now what we're doing here with this boil is we're doing exactly the same thing instead of using a kiln we're using hot water but we're essentially killing these seeds this is not part of the sterilization process this is part of the hydration and preparation process so these these seeds have had time to turn a lot of their contents from kind of these rougher more difficult to digest carbohydrates that store well for long periods uh, while they're asleep and dormant into these uh, maltose sugars, something that their genetics just know how to do. And uh, those maltose sugars are also easier for our mushrooms to digest, which is a critical part of the soak and simmer method. Now you can see I've got it up to a rolling boil near the end. My timer's gone off. It's been 15 minutes. I actually stepped outside and did some gardening. So I think it, it was a little over, it was closer to 18 minutes that it was on the boil. Um, but here I take it off the heat. And this is a critical step for the soak and simmer method as we're teaching it for larger grains. We wanna get it over into a strainer that is suitable for grains. Um, this The grate in this is small enough for almost any kind of grain I can I can pour millet I can pour rice I can pour anything in here now again I could have put a bowl under this strainer and collected that water uh, I decided not to today I just don't have any use for it I don't want to store it and it'll go bad before I have reason to use it so I'm just letting it drain away this is a critical step. You want to get some cold water running. You want to stop this cook. You do not want these grains to cook any further than we've already cooked them. So you want to get cold water going. And you want to be careful about the pressure here. Um, if you have just the right size 
strainer like I do, you can accidentally spray a lot of these grains out and into the sink. You can always collect them, but that's a pain. Uh, so you wanna be careful, but you wanna give it a thorough spray down. You wanna make sure you stop all this steaming. You want the temperature to drop dramatically in this entire body of grain here. Um, for wheat, uh, there is a step that's critical after this that we're gonna skip. Uh, that's, it, it's critical for other grains. It's critical for rye berries. I'm pretty sure it's critical for oats. Um, any of the big grains besides wheat. For wheat, it's not a problem to skip it. We're gonna go ahead and skip it, but I'll describe it now. After we rinse these grains, if we were working with rye berries, for example, and it's optional, you can also do it with wheat, um, which optional with wheat. We would leave this strainer to drain for 12 to 24 hours, such that the outside surface of all the grain becomes dry. You can do the paper towel test at the end of that draining period, uh, that drying period, you can, um, put out a paper towel, drop some grains from the middle of it onto the paper towel, and if they do not leave water on the paper towel, then they're ready to go. Now we're skipping that step here because red wheat berries can handle it. It doesn't bother them if you do that step. I get no different results out of it if I, if I do that step or if I don't. So we've gone straight from the rinsing process after letting it drain for a few minutes to packing it into the jars here. Now I know that five scoops will fill each jar to the height that I want, leaving enough room for me to shake the jars. Um, and also that the approximately 2.5 pounds that I eyeballed into the pot will fill these six jars with five scoops each. Um, I showed off the grain there for a moment. That is uh, what the grain's supposed to look like. That is perfect. You can see that the grain is a little wet. Uh, you don't want to see that if you're working with rye berries, and I believe also oat. I've never used oat, so I may be wrong. Um, you also want to avoid pouring in any excess water like you see me doing here. You really want for rye berries in particular to be fully dried out. They still have their internal moisturization from the first soaking step, and, but you don't want the external exterior of those rye berries to be wet. Again, with the red wheat berries though, uh, it's not a problem. They have a way of reabsorbing the water that um, I've just never seen in other grains. So here I'm prepping the lids. Now you can do lids with self-healing inje self injection ports, whether you buy in ports that you uh, drill precise holes for and fit into the, hole, into the lids, or whether you use heat resistant silicone and just punch some holes. Uh, if you do the silicone method, you probably wanna prep these these lids ahead of time. Now I do have a flow hood and I will show its use. And uh, as a result, I, I don't need to do a lot of lid prep here. I'm just gonna punch some holes in these. I am using a drill bit. I usually use a nail, but I couldn't find my nail I used for this and, and this was nearby. So I just grabbed it. Um, I just punched these little holes in it. And then I put two layers of micropore tape each over each of these holes. So after this, I prepare 
six uh, foil sheets of heavy duty aluminum foil and I get ready to cover them up. Now one thing you'll see me doing here is I'm tightening all these lids all the way. Now I'm gonna loosen them again, but if you know that they're tightened, then you know that they're in a certain orientation and it's easier to not accidentally over loosen them when we go on to this next step. Now I wanna give a shout out to Willie Maiko, uh, who, who really detailed the right way to, to apply foil to jars like this in, in one of his videos i i was doing it sloppily before and really taking the time to do this right improved my uh contamination rate so first you want to make sure your lid is tight still and then loosen it by a quarter turn all right before you start putting the foil on loosen it by a quarter turn it doesn't matter uh don't try to feel for the right amount just know that you had it tight loosen it a quarter turn then you want to brush the foil down the sides such that it's as close as you can get it and at this point you try to start f shaping the foil around it to fit the form of the lid you really want to get it as form fitting as you can into the seams of of the lid and the lip of the jar we'll do another one here it doesn't matter which way the foil faces it's, it's not important the main purpose of this foil is to keep the lids from flying off to keep um, water from getting inside the jars, to protect the um, micropore tape that we just put on top, and to just help prevent airflow into the jar through any other part but the, uh, the micropore tape itself. You don't want it closed all the way, they can explode. Um, they don't always, it's sometimes just the micropore tape is enough pressure relief, but uh, it's it decreases the integrity of the jars over time. So you wanna make sure you have that quarter turn open. There we go. We're gonna move on over to my pressure cooker. Now this is a carry DS something or other. It is an automated tabletop pressure cooker. It's similar to an Instapot, but it's very much not an Instapot. Uh, don't go Instapot. There's only one Instapot model out there that I, I found in my research that can do pressure canning, and it is not big enough to handle quart size jars, which is pretty much necessary. Uh, this is a very small pressure canner, but it makes up for it by being very fully automated. I can ignore this thing instead of having to babysit it all day. I can only do three to four jars at a time, um, but uh, I, I don't have to think much about it. Now what I'm doing here is I'm setting it to a high pressure canning setting, um, and then I'm going to set it to 90 minutes. I made sure that the top spout, the weight that holds it down, which is a 15 pound weight, is set to the open position meaning it's not it's not currently closing the valve now it wants I'm just checking there to make sure that it's it's securely closed in the closed position the uh, weight is in the exhaust position which will just let everything flow out um, I'm getting my other jar set up for the next run and I'm just letting it run now now I do have to do a little bit of babysitting so it's about to First, it has to build up temperature, and it's building up temperature and a little bit of pressure, and then it's gonna beep at me. You're not gonna hear it, I've cut out that part of the audio. But it'll beep, and then it'll give me a message. Here it says E10. This particular model might differ from yours. Um, that E10, I interpret it as you have 10 minutes till an error happens. When that E10 happens, what it's telling me is to close that valve on top, as you saw me do. Once that valve is closed, it'll take its time to build up pressure again, and then it starts the timer. Now you can see the countdown timer. At this point, it is pressure cooking. It's pressure canning, in fact. And now it's done. This is 90 minutes later. Um, it's not depressurized yet. You can see this bit of tape here. 
It's covering a valve, the safety valve that keeps that closed when it's under pressure. And what that does is when the valve opens, it prevents air from flowing in except through the microport tape. Now that this is open, I want to close these lids quickly. Uh, they're still pretty hot. The foil's on them pretty well, so but I want to still get them closed quickly. They don't have to be hot, um, but it's kind of better if they are. All right, now they're all sealed shut. Now the only way for gas exchange to get through them is through the microport tape. Now, because this model's so great and automatable, after no, I can just fire it up again and start using it again. Now, this is not as easy to do with like a stovetop pressure cooker. Um, this really saves me a lot of time. I'm gonna fill it back up to four cups uh, for this particular model, for this particular type of pressure canning, you put four cups of water in it. That's the instructions and that's how it works. Uh, your model will have different instructions, follow those. But here, we've got it closed. We've opened the vent again. We've got to turn it back on. Uh, we've got to set it to high. Don't use low. Uh, it will explode your jars. And then set it to 90 minutes and then start. Now, I'll listen again for the uh, beep to tell me when to close that exhaust. And once that exhaust is closed, I can walk away from this. I'm not doing any more jars today. I could go to sleep and let it sit overnight and ignore it. Um, here's the grains. They look a little more wet than you would expect them to. Now, whether or not you go through the drying step with wheat berries, they're going to come out looking like this. They expunge, expel some of their moisture from the initial soak during the pressure cook. And you're going to see that whether, whether you do the drying step or not, you're going to see that. If you, if you did rye berries and they come out looking like this, that might be a problem. These uh, wheat berries will reabsorb that water. By tomorrow, they will look completely different. Here they are again on the shelf. You can see again, this is a lot more moisture than you normally would want in your finished grain. But these wheat berries will reabsorb this. And even again, if you even did the drying step that I discussed earlier, they would still come out looking like this because they do exhaust some, of, expel some of their water. In fact, here's an example of what they'll look like tomorrow. This, these looked exactly the same when they first came out. Note how the grains are still intact. They're still full and they can f flow freely. They're not stuck together. They're not mushy. They're not goopy. They're not exploded. Um, and then here's a jar that is beginning to colonize already. This one's only been inoculated a few days. It's starting to grow. Uh, it's very healthy. I don't see any signs of contamination. There's a little bit of bag in there. You can see that thread it's from the bag. Uh, but yeah. That's how it goes. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, really appreciate it.